Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. My name is Mike, this is my whiteboard, and today we're gonna to be talking about three concepts that beginner traders should master. So when we're just getting into the space and we're talking about learning about options and all of the things that go into it, it can be very easy to get overwhelmed with just the massive amount of content and the massive amount of concepts and strategies that we can get into, but there are a few things that I found really important when I was learning, and I think if we master just these three concept concepts, we can easily translate any of these things into future learning and make learning about different strategies and different concepts a lot easier. But first, I actually have a big announcement to make, so let's go on to the next slide and we'll talk about that just a little bit. So this show specifically is actually going to end this week. So this is going to be the last week and then over the next two weeks we're going to be showing you some of the top videos over the course of the last about year and a half. This will be the 160th episode so by Friday we'll have 163 episodes that are all evergreen and they're all basically episodes and segments that you can go back to and check out for different strategies and different concepts where we take a, talk about them from a beginner to intermediate level and really what we're going to be doing is we're going to be moving this show and we're going to be merging it with Jim Schultz. So if you are familiar with Jim's show from theory to practice, we're actually going to be merging that. So he's going to move to this time slot ideally and then we're going to talk about different concepts and strategies together. So it's going to be a show with me and Jim together and we're going to be talking about a few different things. So I'm really excited about this because I think we have an opportunity to present you guys with a lot of great content in this manner. So number one, we're going to be doing some beginner dough tutorials because Jim is a toss guy, but I am a dough guy. So I'm gonna show him how to use dough and it's gonna, I'm gonna make it in a sense to really show someone that understands thinkorswim and really bring them into the dough world and show them all the benefits and the cool things about that we're doing here with dough. So we're gonna be doing that and we're also gonna talk about concepts and strategies. So you'll see a lot of the similar slides and concepts that I've already talked about and some things that he's already talked about as well. We're gonna merge it together and we're gonna bring you a discussion similar to Ryan and Beef and Liz and Jenny. So it's going to be really cool and we're going to bring a lot to the table in that sense. And we're also going to be trading in dough. So it's going to be another show that will be trading in dough exclusively. So just another awesome show and I'm really excited for it. It is bittersweet because I have had a ton of fun with the whiteboard show, but I think we have had a lot of concepts and we've got a, pretty much everything down. Over 163 episodes of concepts and strategies that are evergreen, which means we can always go back to them and check them out for concrete information. So be sure to do that. They'll always live in the archives. And again, we'll be talking about a lot of the content that I presented here on the new show. So look out for the new show on 718. That will be our first day, as Tom mentioned this morning as well. So let's get right into today's concept, and that's going to be the three concepts that beginner traders should master. So the very first one that I want to talk about is really just mastering the fundamental options. When I was learning about the options and different strategies, I was actually learning and trying to force myself to learn too many things at once. So what I did was I took a step back and I really made sure that I understood just the fundamental concepts. So when I say fundamental concepts, I'm talking about what is a long call and what is a long put and what are the implications of that? And then I looked on the flip side. So what is a short put and what is a short call? So let's review them really quickly. So a long call is just the right to buy 100 shares of stock at a certain strike price. So if I own the call contract, I can either exercise that before expiration, which gives me the right to buy those 100 shares, or I can let it expire and if it's in the money, it will automatically exercise into long shares. Similarly, if I have a put, it's just the opposite, but I still have that right to exercise. So if I have a long put, I have the right to sell 100 shares at the strike and at expiration, if it's in the money, just like a long call or any of these options for that matter, it'll automatically exercise into those short shares. So I have the right to sell 100 shares, but if I don't actually own those shares, but I still actually own the put, it'll turn into short 100 shares. So when I have a short put, it's just the opposite of a long put. So it would get, it would have the obligation or really present me with the obligation to buy 100 shares at that strike if the long put owner ended up exercising it prior to expiration. So when we're dealing with short options, that is where we have that early assignment risk. We are not at, the, we don't have the ability to exercise those options. The long option holders do. So when we're dealing with short options, that's where the early assignment risk can come into play, but it really only comes into play when we're dealing with in the money options. 
So a short put is a situation where I have the obligation to buy 100 shares at that strike if the option is exercised, and just the opposite for a short call. So we're looking at a short call, which is really just the obligation to sell 100 shares at that strike. But what's really important is once you understand and master the fundamentals of these, where I can eliminate all of these descriptions here and I can know exactly what is implied when I look at a long call or a long put or a short call or a short put. What's really interesting is that once you start to add these together or create different scenarios and different spreads, like for example, a vertical spread, all I'm doing is taking a short put here and I'm combining it with a long put. So what does that mean? Well, it'll mean that my risk is defined because if the short put is the obligation to buy 100 shares and a long put is the right to sell 100 shares, if I have both of those options at different strikes, it doesn't matter if it's completely in the money, my risk is going to be defined at the difference between the strikes because one of these options is going to get me long shares at expiration and the other option is going to get me short shares at expiration. And really, all of the option strategies are just combinations of these four things. So if you really hone in and master each of these four things and really learn when this option is profitable and when another option option is profitable, once you start to combine those, you can start to say, okay, a short put will start to increase in value or gain money when the stock goes up, where the opposite is true with the long put. But if I combine them together and my short option is sold more or sold for more than my long option is purchased for, that's really where the profitability comes into play. So when we start to add all these together, you can clearly see that all of the strategies that we talk about here are just combinations of these four things. So I would say the very first thing a beginner trader should really hone in on is focusing on these four options and really learning and mastering the implications of them. But there are some other things that I wanna talk about today, so let's get on to the next slide and we'll talk about those. So another thing that is really important to master is the concept of liquidity. Not only will it give us fair markets, but it's also going to give us a smoother trading environment. So when I talk about liquidity, really what we're talking about here is a few things. So we're talking about the bid-ask spread, open interest, and volume. So when we're looking at the bid-ask spread, when it comes to liquidity, basically the more participants there are in a market, the more fair that price is going to be. So if you think about 50 people trying to sell an item and 50 people trying to buy an item, the closer, the more people there are, the closer they're going to be able to get on that fair price. But if there's only one person trying to buy an option or item and one person selling it, there's more of a chance that there's gonna be a discrepancy between that price. Maybe I would think something's worth $50 where another person thinks something's worth $20. But if there's 50 of us on either side, we can come to an agreement that a fair price is at whatever level it is. So the more people that are in the market, usually we're going to see a much more fair price, which is really gonna be benefiting our bid ask spread, which is ultimately where we can get into an option and where we can get out of an option, or where we can get into a stock and where we can get out of a stock. If that spread is too wide, it can lock us into situations that aren't favorable. And really I did actually do a whiteboard on that, so I'm going to include links for all of these concepts and include all the whiteboards that I've previously done in this segment, so you can always go back to the description below once this video is archived. Another thing we're looking at when we're talking about liquidity is open interest. And open interest is really just the number of outstanding or open contracts for that specific strike. So if I'm looking at an expiration in July and I'm looking at maybe a 195 strike in SPY, the open interest will show me the number of open contracts in that specific strike and specific expiration. So really what that tells me is that if I open a trade, and there's a lot of open interest there, then in the future, if I wanted to potentially close that trade or roll that trade, I should be able to as long as there's a lot of open contracts available because that just means that there's a lot of opportunity to place trades in the future. Volume is very similar, but just a little bit different. So volume is going to give us the number of contracts that actually traded throughout that day. So if someone opened a contract, that would be one tick on volume. And if someone closed that contract, that would be another tick on volume. So really volume is just showing us the total transactional, the total transactions in that specific 
strike or underlying for that trade. And when we're looking at volume, we also can see the volume of shares traded per day. So we have volume for shares and the actual strike and option, but for open interest, we're really just looking at the option. But understanding these concepts is really going to get us a long way when we're looking at picking out underlyings that are liquid, and picking out underlyings and specifically expirations and strikes that we can deal with. Because a lot of times when we're using spreads, like things like vertical spreads or iron condors or, or jade, lizard, jade lizards, what we don't realize is that we're, we might throw out a trade and we might not get filled right away, or the market might exceed the price that we put in there and we might not get filled at all. What we have to realize is that each of those legs must be liquid. So if I have a three-legged trade or a four-legged trade or a two-legged trade, I need to make sure that each of those legs and each of those options is liquid because if one of them isn't, regardless of whether the other ones are liquid or not, we're not going to be able to get filled because in order for us to be filled, the market maker has to account for each of those legs. So if one of those legs is a liquid, we're probably gonna have a hard time getting filled both in into the trade and also out of the trade. So we wanna make sure that we're very well versed on liquidity so that we're able to get in and out of trades quickly because the worst case scenario is that we've got a trade on and it's very profitable, but we can't get out of it. So we're forced to hold the risk because of the fact that we can't get out of the trade because there's low liquidity. So that's why we always stick to the liquid markets and the most liquid underlyings as well. But I do have one more concept that I want to talk about today, and that is implied volatility. So on the next slide, we're going to talk about the things that really matter with implied volatility and the implications behind it. So why would we want to master the concept of implied volatility? Well, really, it's all about the overstated option pricing. So implied volatility is really just the percentage implied move over the course of one year. So if I have an underlying that's trading for $100 and it has an implied volatility of 30 30%, that basically means that the underlying has the ability to go up 30% or down 30% over the course of the year, or at least that's what is implied for that movement. So the underlying could go from 70 to 130, anywhere in that range over the course of a year. That's basically what implied volatility is showing you. But what is really important is understanding where implied volatility comes from. So the option prices actually drive implied volatility, not the other way around. And what's really interesting is that when you look at implied volatility, what we found is that implied volatility generally overstates the realized implied volatility. So in that same example, if the implied volatility was 30% and I came back to that value a year later, maybe it only actually moved 10% or 20%. That would mean that option prices are more expensive than they actually should be or they how they should be priced. So if we're selling options and realized volatility ends up being understated or realized volatility ends up being underneath where implied volatility is, that is what gives us the ability to be profitable when we're selling premium. And that's really what we want to focus on here. So be sure to master all three of these concepts when you're beginning and starting out as an options trader. But let's wrap all this together with some takeaways for you. So the first takeaway is options education can be overwhelming. As we learn more about certain things, we might go into different rabbit holes and realize that there is a lot of content, but if you really focus on one specific thing or one specific strategy and really master it, it makes it a lot easier to start learning about other concepts. So I would say focus on one thing at a time and really understand that concept or strategy. For me, I really focused on the naked options as I stated, and I also focused on just basic vertical spreads and iron condors. From there, and once I realized what would happen with the option prices as the underlying moved, I then was able to easily go into things like jade lizards and ratio spreads and all those other strategies that are a little more complex. And the real learning will obviously take place when we're trading, so be sure to Get your hands dirty if you have a paper money account, that's great, or if you have a real money account, that's great. But really, the real learning comes when you're trading and you actually see these things being put into practice. So thanks so much for tuning in. My name is Mike. If you've got any questions or feedback, shoot me an email here, or you can follow me at Doge. You know, we've got Jim Schultz coming up next. What's up, YouTube? Thanks for watching our video. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Click below to watch more videos, subscribe to our channel, or go live to that. Sorry. <laughs>